Great, we'll get started now. Welcome everyone to our session on connecting the unconnected. Our, pa our original moderator unexpectedly had to leave, and so I'm filling in for the moderator, and I will continue to add a few comments to the topic as well. Joining uh, us today on the panel, Ken Hu, Deputy Chairman and Rotating CEO of Huawei. To his left, Jonathan Jackson, Founder and CEO of Demaji. To his left, Stefan Kazrial, Founder and CEO of Upworks. And finally, Secretary General Zhou Holin of the ITU. So our plan for today, we'll start with some opening comments in which each of our panelists will say a bit about the work that they do and give us context for their comments to follow. After that, we'll have a series of themes of topics about accessibility, what it means, what's happening, what challenges we face, what they've seen and what works. And then we'll have some questions from you. So please think about what's of interest to you and the questions that you'd like to ask. And of course, a summarization at the end. And so as we talk about connecting the unconnected, we mean the broadest sense possible. Everything from access to a device, to access to data, to digital literacy, to relevant local content, to changing the impact on one's life, and the ability to create, to become a full citizen of the web, and to improve and affect one's own life across a range of activities. And our panelists bring a breadth of experience and represent many places along that spectrum and in their opening comments, we'll ask them to describe where they work primarily in that spectrum and what they've seen. And with that, I'm going to ask Ken to get us started. Thank you, uh, thank you Michelle. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's my uh, pleasure to be in this uh, discussion. Uh, let me give you a few words about Huawei. Uh, we are a ICT solutions provider, and uh, uh, we deploy our uh, broadband infrastructure in uh, 150 countries for um, around 400 telecom carriers, and uh, we serve um, thousands of enterprise for the IT solution, and we also shipped 100 million um, smartphones to the market every year. Um, in our business operation, we observed that while the technology is changing so fast, while we are heavily investing on the advanced technology and the applications like 3G and 4G, Internet of Things, mobile internet, all these kind of very popular things, we still have to remember that there are 4 billion people, 4 billion people around the world without any access to the internet. And most of them are living in countries with underdeveloped uh, economy and very weak um, broadband infrastructure. But I'm very, I'm very confident that if we can provide the supportive policies and we can properly deploy the emerging technology, we will have the chance to help those people and to connect those unconnected population in a uh, in, in a, in a much faster way than before. So uh, in my opinion, there are two key areas we can pay extra effort. One is the broadband infrastructure and the other one is the uh, application, and particularly the mobile application. Firstly, we have to develop a stronger broadband infrastructure with broader coverage and faster speed. And this will make the broadband infrastructure a critical driver for the local economy. And this needs a joint effort from my perspective. This, this needs a joint effort from all the stakeholders, including the governments, the regulators, the industries, and even the consumers. And the governments can establish a very clear vision that the broadband infrastructure should be a critical national infrastructure and a key enabler for the local economy. And the government can actually encourage the sharing of the civil engineer, uh, engineering uh, infrastructures like the pipe, like the cable, like the electricity between the different you know, operators and that will help them you know, greatly reduce the cost of their operation. And even the government can initiate some you know, um, public-private partnership 
for the um, national broadband network, this will greatly speed up the whole process. And we have seen many successful cases in the country like Malaysia, like Singapore, and, and also in, uh, in Australia. And the regulators, we expect that the regulators can um, introduce a better mechanism for the existing uh, spectrum resource allocation, which is to greatly help the operators to reduce the cost of the spectrum, because from our uh, observation, in some of the cases, uh, cases the cost of spe spectrum even accounts for 20% of the total cost of the internet access. And the regulators should pay extra effort to help increase the supply of the spectrum resource. Let me share you some of the figures. From our observation, um, at the year 2020, because that's the timeline for us to introduce a 5G technology globally. And this will help us to uh, achieve the ultra broadband network in most of the countries in the, uh, in the world. And with the 5G technology, we need at least 300 to 500 megahertz spectrum in each country. And that means we need to increase the supply for, for around 50% to 100%. So I believe that the quick actions are needed. And on the technology side, I, I believe that the, the uh, technology providers like Huawei should try their effort in the technological innovation to help the uh, developing countries to introduce the emerging technology in the same pace with the developed countries. And I believe we can actually make it happen. In addition to the strong broadband infrastructure, the application, particularly the mobile application, will be another key driver for the connectivity. In the developing countries, we can expect that the mobile application to generate more usage of, of, the, of the connectivity. And particularly in the, in the developing countries, the mobile application is greatly changing the people's lives. So let me share with you a very successful story in Kenya, a country in, uh, in Africa. Uh, there is a mobile application called M-Pesa in Kenya. Uh, it is an um, um, e-payment application helps the users to uh, enjoy the finance service uh, with their mobile phone, with their mobile account. And this particularly helped the people living in the rural area enjoy the finance service for the first time in their life, because they had never had their own bank account. And uh, after the operator in Kenya launched this service in one year, they achieved one million subscribers, which is amazing. Because the total subscriber base is around 10 billion, but they achieved the 1 million. Uh, 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 it's 10 million. So they achieved the 1 million in, in a year. Very impressive. And I believe in the same way, we're going to have the chance to promote the mobile ap applications for a lot of things for education, for healthcare, and, and so on and so forth. So in order to develop the mobile application, I believe we need the technological innovation. We need the business innovation across the different stakeholders. And I particularly <coughs> expect that we have supportive policy system. I would expect that the regulators to keep open mind to any of the business innovation across the different stakeholders, to let them explore, and to let them share the benefit, to let them share the revenue. And I do believe that eventually, the light touch approach will help us to build up a more balanced regulatory framework. So to sum up, the open mind, technological innovation, business innovation will help us to better develop our broadband infrastructure and the mobile application and to build up a better ecosystem and eventually, eventually help us to get those unconnected people better connected. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, Damagi, my organization, is a cloud-based provider of technology that enables organizations to create mobile applications. Our target market is in developing, market, uh, developing economies. We operate in 50 countries and mostly empower organizations who employ frontline workforces. So examples of our programs with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we're working in India to empower many rural providers in both nutrition and healthcare with our technology to provide better services more efficiently and more, more fast. We also powered the Ebola contact tracing program in Guinea when that outbreak occurred with our software. 
And in those, both of those use cases, we have the challenge not just of being a software provider, but of effectively being a technology equipment provider as well, because often when you deploy our platform, you need to buy the mobile devices for that workforce. And so we have a big challenge in our business model and in our scalability, because it's the equivalent of you having to convince your business or organization to buy a fleet of laptops just because you want to use Excel. And imagine trying to make the business case to buy Excel when you also have to load in the cost of a laptop. And for us, that's what we're currently facing right now. We have shown through countless randomized control trials improvement of up to 27% in workforce performance, improvement of 70% in antenatal care visits. But the cost of implementing our software includes the cost of buying phones, buying data, buying solar chargers in some cases. And so we need to work with partners like everybody here to figure out how is it not just Demagi's software that's sharing the cost of that device, of that data, but everybody who can benefit from that, whether it's the community, the health system, the public sector, the private sector, because the scalability of our model is very dependent on it not being just me who needs to buy that phone. And we have to somehow share the benefit of that device, that connection, with the user who we're giving that device to, the program that's benefiting from that device, and it's very challenging right now in today's environment for us to do that. Right now, we have to go make a case to the Ministry of Health and say, if you equip all of your frontline workforce with Tamagi's technology, you're going to get this benefit. And while that benefit is very large, the cost is also very large because it's coming with the purchase price of all of the phones. And if I can go and partner with the Educational Ministry or the Finance Ministry or the Agriculture Ministry to add M-PESA, to add educational programs, now all of a sudden I can dramatically decrease the cost I have to go to the government with to convince them to use Demagi's technology. And so our big challenge here is how do we work with partners to enable that ecosystem so that a more compelling business case can be made. In our uh, work, the equipment and the mobile phones, they're already ahead of where we need them. You know, we, we don't need constant connectivity. We just need a drip of 2G to get our data back to our cloud once in a while. We don't need to, to move a lot of high-speed data. Um, and, and the network has really expanded in a great way in most of the environments we work with. But um, it is going to be the case that you can build even better applications if you have 4G or 5G. So we'll, we'll come up to these problems soon. And that's why for us, we're really interested in this problem of how do we create a regulatory environment that creates a lot of value all at once in both a consumer-oriented model and in a more traditional enterprise model for the users that we're empowering. So a uh, consistent theme of regulation already. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, Stefan Castriel, my company is called Upwork. Uh, it's a brand new name, but it's not a brand new company. It's the merger between two Silicon Valley based companies. One was called Elance, uh, founded in 98, and the second one was called Odesk, founded in 2004. And we merged the two companies and relaunched the company under the new name. Um, so, we are the uh, largest uh, online marketplace for freelance work. We operate globally. We operate in 160 uh, different countries. And uh, our vision is to connect businesses with uh, freelance talent, irrespective of location, faster and more efficiently than ever before. Um, to give you some numbers, we uh, connect 4 million clients on one side, so buyers of the talent, to 10 million freelancers on the other side. We process about a billion dollars a year of uh, transactions, and we do this across 3,000 skills. So pretty much anything that um, a knowledge worker can do in front of a mobile device or a laptop connected through the internet uh, are skills that uh, are useful in our platform. Um, to give you a little bit of a, a sense of you know, how we position ourselves in this discussion here, um, you, you know, there's been discussions around the enablement, you know, the, the what and the how. Uh, how do we create this connectivity? Um, what I think we bring here to the discussion is the why. Uh, why should a regulator, a government, uh, or a service provider be interested in offering that connectivity to uh, their constituents? And um, you know, essentially what we provide here is access to a uh, global uh, list of, of jobs that a newly connected individual can have access to. Um, to give you some examples of countries where this has been really successful for us, we started noticing about three years ago that people from Bangladesh were signing up on our sites. And, you know, these things happen kind of organically. This is the beauty of the internet. You know, we don't necessarily need to advertise a lot. Um, but it was definitely starting to be a, a trend. So we started, you know, traveling there more frequently and then hiring a small team locally. Uh, and today, Bangladesh is one of our uh, very much thriving countries. It's growing really, really fast for us. And 
frankly, the key enabler with, for this was the fact that a already highly educated workforce suddenly had access to much better connectivity and the ability for them to browse our site, sign up, um, apply to jobs, and then eventually get paid. Secretary Joe. It's me. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, uh, dear friends. Uh, it's a really great pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. This Hi. is my first visit to this uh, conference. It works? Yes, it works. Yeah, it's my first visit to this uh, conference. And I noted that uh, Ken Hu had been here already for many years, many times. I found this topic is quite important for us. Not like uh, my, my friends here, they are all from different companies. The ITU, International Telecommunication Union, is a specialized UN agency responsible for ICT and the telecom. And this year we celebrate our 150th anniversary. It's quite old. It's the oldest UN agency. Uh, however, we have many things different from the other UN agencies. In, in ITU, we have uh, also our membership from industries. So uh, we have more than 700 uh, uh, ICT telecom uh, companies, uh, our members, and Huawei and, and many others, all our members. And recently we got also new members uh, like uh, Google, Facebook, they join us. I'm pretty sure that uh, Alibaba will join us as well. So we welcome you, if you're not a student member yet, you know, we, we welcome you to join us. And in ITU, we have uh, three major sectors. One sector is uh, called the standardization sector, where we have developed all uh, telecom global standards, and including those standards like uh, H264. You may not know this one, but without this ITU standard, nobody can use your mobile phone today, because that the video coding is ITU the standard. And, uh, of course, the 3G, 4G, all these technologies defined by ITU. And ITU, uh, you know, except the standards, we also have uh, uh, spectrum issues. So uh, radio communication access technologies, uh, you know, these uh, satellite communications, uh, you know, all these uh, broadcasting, television, all the spectrum were coordinated by ITU. Now, nowadays, we have problem with the spectrum for 4G. And that should be coordinated by ITU to find enough uh, spectrum to meet the future need. And ITU will have its next uh, World Radio Conference in Geneva in November this year. And we expect uh, 3,500 experts from everywhere, including the experts from industries and uh, government officials, uh, regulators, coming together to look at uh, the issues and try to find the solutions. Of course, uh, network security is also our uh, important uh, working area. So Madam Baker and his her company, we recognize that they are excellent contributing to the uh, security uh, studies of uh, network. You know, that, that we even have a chance and honor to award uh, Madam Baker and uh, her company as a, award, uh, as a laureate of our very famous uh, World Telecom Information Society Award, and she was awarded. So this is uh, from a technical uh, point, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, such kind of uh, job. And we also have uh, a very, very important job to, to encourage the market development. You know, we, since 1997, the telecom become business now. And before 1997, it was a government uh, monopolized uh, uh, technology or business, now become a uh, you know, market business. So we encourage people to open their uh, in the market and uh, have uh, market development. And we are very pleased to know that uh, with uh, very good uh, support from industry and from government, and ICT and the telecom received a marvelous uh, achievement over the last uh, decade. And according to ITU, that uh, today, you know, among 7.3 billion population, we have more than 7.2 billion mobile subscriptions. Of course, you know, that uh, can, Mr. Hu just mentioned that the half population not connected, he is absolutely correct. That because many of us have more than one mobile phone, so if we divide this by two, it's already half delegation, half population is not connected yet. And coming to the internet connection, it's even worse. You know, that uh, at least two thirds of people are not connected yet. 
And I recently uh, visited a lot of uh, African countries because for us, uh, connectors are also not connected yet. It's a very, very important uh, topic for us. And uh, as you know, the, I'm a secret general starting from 1st of January this year. People ask me what uh, I would like to take uh, as a good uh, uh, result uh, under my leadership of these organizations. I said if uh, those programs are connected, not connected yet be improved, that would be great. Of course, to connect to those not connected yet is not an easy job. That's because uh, you know, that we have such wonderful achievement over the last decade. There was, uh, or still is, very strong perceptions that ICT and the telecom is a profit-making industry. And there are a lot of uh, you know, reasons to believe this is uh, you know, sustainable, self-sustainable, so you don't need to, to, you know, to pay much attention. And they will be developed you know, by them, themselves. Actually, it's not correct. You know, to connect those who are not connected yet. This area you know, that, uh, is uh, normally it's a poor area. And you even need more more support to, to, to encourage people to invest money there, invest uh, your, 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 your technologies, your, your, your future there. But the problem is uh, you know, that this area is not a profit making from, from current, uh, current uh, you know, that understanding that uh, if this is not a profit making, how can you get uh, people invested there? And if it's already profit making, why is it not corrected? So that is logical, it's simple like that. And also our industries, you know, competition among themselves is very, very tough. Mr. Hu is very, very proud to, you know, to support this uh, uh, devils, some devils here in, in, because he has uh, much, much, uh, you, know, uh, you know, many reasons to, 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 to be confident here. But uh, look at his uh, competitors uh, in a couple of years ago. Some of them very famous in the world, like Nokia. Nokia completely disappeared. So this is uh, for, the, for the equipment manufacturers. And today, the competition is still there, very tough. Recently, Luzon Alcatel you know, merged with Nokia. What happened? They cannot survive by themselves. They have to form. So all this is not, uh, it's not easy. And, uh, we need a, a continuous support from uh, global leaders. So that is uh, one of the, uh, my tasks. You know, that I, I visited many countries this year, meet with many head of states and head of governments, and I invite them to help us to continue to pay attention to ICT and, and uh, telecom development. Now here we need uh, also from industry, we need a good strategy to have good technologies. And the innovation is very important. We may need to have new ways to connect those not connected yet, and new technologies, but also we need a good environment for us to go there. And this environment cannot be created by industry only, and even you have fair competitions. If the environment is not good, that is still, you cannot go to the right place to go to invest. And for this, we also need a, you know, good strategies. For example, IT consider that the broadband connections is very important. And we set up together with UNESCO a broadband commission for sustainable development. And Huawei is one of our members. We worked with them. And we found uh, this is absolutely important. You know, we, according to our uh, study, you know, if we have 10% uh, of uh, mobile penetrating developing countries, the GDP could be increased by 1.8%. So it's very, very, very clear advantages. So but actually, the, that, that raises, you, if I might, your, your point about profit and increased GDP yeah. leads me to um, the, the question, you talked about profit making, the need, the need for profit, the fierceness of competition a, a across the, the uh, ecosystem. And so it, it leads me to wonder, I think there still is a range of connectivity, just actual access and data and building the infrastructure. And in that setting that you've just described of profit making and, and competition, do it, does it, is your experience, and I'm asking the whole panel here, that um, the network operators themselves can do this? Is, is the model, so Ken suggested some changes to regulation that would assist network operators in, in reducing cost. So, do, 
do, do you see the, the model of network operators being the sole provider, maybe with better regulation as the path, or, or are there some other solutions? And so you've kind of opened that discussion, and I'm sort of interested in, in, in what you've seen and, and what you think. Um, and, and you know, I know that, that, that you said, Jonathan, that you're not sure accessibility of data is the key aspect. So it's this question of what do we expect the network operators to do? Uh, how deep the regulation? Is the profit-making issue that, that the secretary raised, does that mean we should expand the model? Any thoughts on that? Well, I, I think you raised an excellent point. The, if the current business models worked, this wouldn't be a problem. Right? So clearly, <laughs> nobody can correctly monetize the unconnected now, or they would just get connected. And so we need some type of new model. And I think it's going to be a combination of all of the actors figuring out how do users make benefit from being connected, how do the hardware and software providers benefit, what is the regulatory framework that's going to enable that to happen. And I do think, you know, as the Director General pointed out, there's huge GDP potential. So there's, there's money there. The problem is no model applies for any one actor to capture that benefit today. And I think that's where government has a huge role to play, which is they're the you know, looking over the entire society, if you can get a 2% bump in your GDP, that's worth a lot of thought in how to align all the public-private actors to share in the, the benefit of that. So in, in our work, for example, if we're equipping a health worker with a phone, a smartphone, maybe that health worker can make more money on the side, maybe the government can have that health worker collect other data that was gonna be costly to, to, to collect on their own, so they can create enough pockets of revenue generation to justify the overall cost of that investment. And so that's, what, that's how we go about it. I'm sure there's other solutions, but trying to aggregate all the beneficiaries and then create a model that somebody can successfully go use a market-driven approach for. Oh, that's actually interesting because we have some examples of that with Firefox OS and in this case Orange with the combined model of phone, data, some storage, and increasingly we hope content, web literacy content from the work that Mozilla has been doing and, and perhaps some of the other work. So we're doing a little bit of exploration with that model and I wonder, Stefan, Ken, if there's anything you'd like to yeah, uh, add. I, yeah, I want to share uh, my views on that. Uh, actually, we already mentioned you know, different barriers and, uh, in, uh, from our observation. And uh, I do believe that while we're going to uh, uh, find a solution, we need to put, uh, put all the elements into a framework. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a, a new ecosystem, because uh, if you look at today's you know, ICT landscape, there's actually a totally new ecosystem than before. Because, you know, if you look back, you know, 10 years ago, uh, the, the voice service and the, and the lower, lower speed, you know, broadband service is just the, the mainstream of the service. But today, the video, the gaming, the content, and the, the broadband access are the mainstream of the service. So the ecosystem has been changing a lot. We have the connectivity provider, we have the uh, content provider and the service provider, we have consumer regulators, we have a different you know, stakeholders portfolio than before. So uh, my point is that we need to figure out you know, how to uh, take some joint measures from the different stakeholders. And I do believe that the regulation can um, the regulator can play a significant role in this process. Mm -hmm. On the infrastructure side, I just mentioned that, uh, from my perspective, the main barriers are the uh, spectrum resource. We need more spectrum resource, because you know, in the future, you cannot just view the telecom network as a telecom network. It's actually a unified platform, a shared platform for, for the whole society. Mm -hmm. So the spectrum resource is just like the water, like the, the land, like the electricity. It's kind of public resource. You need to find another mechanism to better allocate this uh, you know, uh, resource and the cost. Um, the uh, uh, civil engineering uh, um, you know, infrastructure accounts for 30% to 40% of the cost. And the spectrum you know, accounts for 20%. So how are you going to find out a solution to greatly to, to reduce these two parts? And that will help us make the uh, connectivity more affordable, not just uh, in the you know, developing countries, but also globally. Mm -hmm. And the last is the application. Uh, other panelists have just mentioned that we need a lot of you know, um, you know, support from the regulatory perspective. But from my point of view, I think what we need is just a freedom. We need a bigger space to explore, to try. So that 
that's the reason why, why I mentioned that we need a more open mentality from the, regula from the regulator. Does any, anyone see that coming? More open mind from the regulatory process? Yeah, yeah. I, I too, you know, uh, is naturally it's the place where we talk about, uh, you know, uh, regulation issues. You know, we have several regulations here. We have telecom regulations, we have radio communication regulations, yeah. and we have uh, international telecommunication regulations, and we working very hard to try to facilitate uh, the, the market development with uh, open competitions and fair mm -hmm. competitions. And here, you know, also we heard of quite often that uh, you know, people, uh, industry particularly, you know, are asked that uh, you know, government should not uh, put uh, heavy regulations. You, know, you should uh, have uh, light regulations. Someone talked about no regulations. So, you know, all this, you, 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 you know, it's, uh, not recently uh, in the United States you have this uh, net neutrality. You know, that is a part of regulation issues. So this uh, quite now we heard something new you know, at the Davos, uh, some winter Davos in real Davos, not in Dali, in Davos. This year, 22nd of January, we had a session, and uh, Madam Sun, of uh, her, his chairman, yeah. chairman of uh, Huawei was there, and we we talked about that, and then it was uh, some kind of uh, interesting debate that uh, telecom operators has very, you know. Uh, very, very common views that uh, they are very heavily you know, regulated. Why are the other side, that means the so-called OTT or very added yeah. <laughs> operate, they do not have uh, any regulations. So that is uh, one, one, one view, and this is not fair, seems to be. But then immediately after their complaints, another one in a Google uh, European office said, no, it's not true. We are also very much uh, in a binded with the the request from the local authority, and we spend a lot of money to do a lot of things there. So this, uh, the business model seems not uh, matching, and then it's not easy to talk to each other. But for me, I found there's a risk here. If you don't address the issue properly, who will invest in the future? That yeah. is the problem. So that is the one of uh, my responsibilities, try to, to get the partners, stakeholders come together to address this absolutely important uh, critical issue. I see. So, so you should be the champion of innovation and regulatory approach? Uh, innovation, we are not industries. only talking about innovation of the technologies. Yes. Innovation of these business models could be yes. also quite important. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's not easy. Eh? You know, recently, I was in Africa, you know, two countries I visited. You cannot believe these countries today, yeah. telephone Mobile penetration is still as low as 30%. You might consider this is uh, not possible. And uh, three years ago, when I was in Myanmar, that uh, big uh, population country, telephone penetration was uh, low, low, lower than 5%. So they had a very ambitious goals to reach 50% by the end of this year. So I told the minister, if you open your market, you have the right uh, regulation, right policy to encourage investment, this goal will be reached uh, very quickly. And indeed, after that, they opened the market. But still, until last year, only 25%. We already have uh, some people there. But just, uh, just at the end of August, I, I met with the minister again in, uh, in Kuala Lumpur. I asked him where we are. And he told me it's already 60% now. So very, very good. So you need a good right. environment to encourage investment. We need a public-private partnership. So the environment, the market uh, regulations, and the government uh, policies, I think, are absolutely important. Now I'm very pleased. Every country now has their strategic plan, put the, put the broadband as uh, absolutely critical, strategically important for them to develop their further you know, infrastructure. So the, the piece that Ken was suggesting seems to be happening as broadband as a, as a national priority. And I'm, yeah. I'm interested in that. Perhaps the next topic would be for the people who are connected, or whatever percentage it is in a country, like what is really driving usage and data, if anything? Like what is the actual experience who, of people who have a phone? How are they connected? What's the relationship to content? How important is local content? How do we get it? What have you seen that, that works? And so 
I know that that's really close to the core of what you're doing, and Ken, I'm sure you see a lot of it. So if you could give us your thoughts on content and experience and what happens as people connect. Is it a positive experience? Is it a, a number that's growing but not deep? Like, so, um, so you know, first of all, maybe to answer your, your previous question, I think the, the remaining four billion are not one uniform pocket. You know, like there was a sequencing in how we got to where we are. There is a sequencing on how we go moving forward. The debate on you know for profit versus not for profit, I think, depends on each country. There are countries where the for profit model is viable, and the issue right now is a little bit of an issue of the chicken and the egg. You know, like, yes, GDP will go up, but in order for GDP to go up, you need to put a huge amount of money on the table, and you're not completely sure you're going to be seeing that outcome. What um, I, I would, you know, propose here is to say, um, this is a timing of money issue, and it's an issue of credibility of the, uh, the business case. And one way to solve it is to do it progressively. So if you said, you know, Malaysia, we're gonna go to 50%, you don't necessarily go invest in a massive nationwide uh, network and massive you know, financing across the country, but potentially you, you choose a city as a pilot and you do this on a much smaller scale, which allows you to get some wins, it allows you to validate the business case, et cetera, et cetera. Now, to, to answer your question about content, you know, the, um, uh, the thing we've seen when people do come online and you know, start using our service, um, the, the next challenge is uh, the whole notion of you know, web literacy. You know, there are some things that are uh, potentially obvious for, uh, you know, the people in the room here, which are not obvious for somebody who uh, uses the internet for the first time. And in particular, in our environment, where um, the freelancers from these countries are competing against, you know, freelancers from all over the world, and it's very much a global meritocracy, it is about, you know, whoever is the best wins. And on the other side, you've got clients that are, you know, based in the US or based in Europe, who have certain expectations from the fact that they've been using the internet for you know, 10, 15, 20 years now. Uh, and there, there is that edu education mismatch, which I think is one of the topics that you know, a government who um, wants to invest in connectivity needs to address pretty much at the same time. You know, the, the realization of that extra GDP comes from usage by their constituents. And the proper usage by the constituents is going to be driving GDP. So just giving them the phone and giving them the bandwidth, if they're not properly um, you know, educated on what to do with it and how to uh, establish a business relationship with uh, you know, somebody potentially in another country, that's going to make their um, uh, work a lot more challenging. And as a result, the business case may not be fully realized. And you have a very particular type of education you're speaking of here, which is almost a professional education. And I imagine, Jonathan, you have a different type of education and use case. Yeah, and, and some of our projects, we're going all the way down to educating people on how to use the phone. I mean, it might be the first time they've actually used a mobile device. But our thesis from the first time we were designing our platform was always to focus on low literacy, both at the reading level um, mm -hmm. for, for some of the health workers we work with, but also low digital literacy. So our application to uh, you know, somebody who's been used to using mobile apps for five years would think our application looks ugly you know, and is boxy and things. But we found from a user experience standpoint, that's actually the easiest way for our target users to rapidly get up to speed on the application. So as we look at the, the unconnected and, and what applications are going to drive and motivate their user engagement, I think there's a lot of different models that we need to be exploring because what works for somebody who has a low attention span, has hung a, you know, dealt with thousands of mobile apps, it's a very different thing you want to create than for somebody who might be their first mobile app experience. And so um, in enabling, and from our standpoint as a platform provider, enabling local entrepreneurs or local organizations to do that innovation to create that local content is one of the key drivers of why our platform has been successful. And how do you do that? We, we work with local partners and, and enable them to create content on our platform, and so they're the ones actually designing the content. So our, our application looks different in every country we go into based on what the local government wanted or the local organization, and the degree to which that content was well done is the make or break between whether our platform actually has any benefit. So we've deployed it in health environments where the application was designed poorly, and it, it was a negative value. We wasted time training and, and buying the equipment because it's not getting the health outcome we want. And so for us, I think that localizability of the content is critical. And it's also going to be a critical factor in driving adoption. Now, there may be some applications that are pervasive. I don't know if 
you know, Uber really needs to change their user interface. But for a lot of applications, particularly data-heavy applications, and, and in our space in the enterprise, you need a very different mindset when you're working with somebody who's just coming into the digital age right. versus somebody who's been here for 10 or 15 years. Right. One of the um, projects at Mozilla WebMaker is really aimed at that entry level, not using a phone, but how the phone actually works. Right. And we, we find some of the same things that the UI and experience that makes sense to a designer is not, not relevant at all. And it, it really, at least in our case, is, is, is actually getting into the field and setting aside preconceptions. Um, and I, Ken, you looked like you wanted to say something. I'd like to just take a moment first, if I could, um, because we're coming to the question time, if you have questions. So I'd like to just see a show of hands of the number of people who'd like to ask questions. If it's small, I'm going to keep asking them. Okay, you can, you we'll can keep going. The, yeah, I will no. share uh, oh. my views on the, on the application side very quickly. Um, um, I believe that the applications are not a key driver for the connectivity. And actually, um, I, I really share the point of views from uh, Stephen and, and Jonathan. You know. uh, we have different ways to develop the application business in the different countries, because the market situation is becoming so you know, complicated than before. Because if you look, look at it several years ago, the most popular applications just you know, uh, social media and uh, Facebook and this kind of things. But if you look forward in the next couple of years, while the uh, ICT technology is becoming a driver, a, a enabler for all the you know, industrial transformation, the situation could be very complicated. You cannot find a single solution for all the um, questions. So, but the model of the internet business gave us a great opportunity that you know, we can learn from the mistake. We can learn, we can win from the mistake. So what, what we need to do is just to, to explore. And this actually needs the support from the regulatory perspective. Mm. If you look at Kenya, if you don't, let the, uh, you don't allow the telecom operator to get access to the, to get involved into the financial service, we, don't, we didn't have any opportunity to launch the M-Pesa service. And then, you know, the people, uh, the, the, the people living in the, in the rural area till now, they didn't have any chance to get, to get access to the, to the financial survey. So a open and free um, regulatory framework will greatly help the uh, development of the application business. I just uh, add uh, some observations here. For the content uh, today, you know, we noted that uh, the internet uh, uh, offered uh, a lot of content, you know, but uh, content is still mainly in English. So if we talk uh, some other languages, particularly local languages, it's uh, very poor. So that is the uh, uh, first observation. And then also applications are quite uh, important. I, I believe that uh, even we, uh, we have very modern technology like a 3G, 4G, 5G, like uh, high broadband uh, access to the internet. But you, if you don't have uh, good uh, contents, local applications, and you cannot really reach uh, people in the community, in the area, rural area, or area, even in the city, and everywhere, so if you don't offer plenty of uh, or enough uh, contents to people, you know, that uh, will be still, uh, you know, uh, limited. But to have these uh, applications, local applications, I think that uh, there is a very important uh, part of the industry. Now, IT has not uh, worked that hard in the past. That is SME, small, medium-sized entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And everywhere in the world, particularly you know, when I visit the developing countries, I always try to visit the local high-tech park, or if they don't have, innovation center, incubator center. You find uh, plenty of uh, brilliant uh, local young people. They know the ICT technology. They know their market. They know the people's need. They want to contribute to their country with their local applications. They develop their local products. And marvelous. Cover everything. Education, agriculture, public health, even natural disaster you know, recovery. All these kind of things that you have for these people. I was found also in, in, in February, I was in, 
uh, in Rwanda. That the guy show me his uh, is a young guy, show me his uh, you know product to use SMS to collect money for donation to the older people. So this kind of things, SME is actually important. But then that the SMEs, we found that they can make contributions. They have support from the government. Everybody supports them. But at the international level, there is no platform for them to have uh, opportunities to talk to each other. So IT now, we try to, uh. to create a such a platform to encourage our members to bring SMEs, ICT SMEs. I'm not talking about the other SMEs. ICT SMEs come together to share their experiences, share their projects, share their ideas, possibly look for partnership. I, I also got a very good uh, feedback from big uh, guys like Ericsson, I see, uh, Huawei as well, uh, Intel, you know, all these big guys. They like to also to, to talk to this platform. Because if they want to have any business, why want to have business, to any country, without your look uh, in a partnership from SMEs, I think that the, your success will be much, much discounted. You know? So, so this is very important. We try to, 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 to work on this issue as well. So I, I hear a, a theme of sort of platform for local entrepreneurs and developers yeah. to build content and then somehow have it distributed in, in a local setting. And so I'm thinking certainly two, probably all three of you are building platforms for that. And uh, the secretary has talked about how his innovation in that. Uh, uh, have you found things that work in those platforms? For the, uh, something that, um, if we're thinking about platforms for local entrepreneurs to create content that's relevant, get it distributed, and then also have the successful use case afterwards that you described, perhaps you have some learnings from your own experiences that might be useful more broadly. I know you're nodding your head. Please, go ahead. Well, you know, in a lot of our uh, most successful uh, applications, they have had local languages, they've been built by local partners, and I think one of the challenges that they face as they try to scale is this point, um, you know, about not having connectivity to other SMEs, not knowing what's worked in other countries. One of the big challenges they face, particularly if they're working in public sector applications in, in the healthcare domain that we do a lot of work in, is even if you create the perfect application, how do you drive adoption? Right, and that's a, mm -hmm. a very challenging issue, particularly if you're not trying to monetize your application. So if you're trying to give away your application because it has a public health benefit, you need to work with the government, you need to work with donors, you need to work with a whole host of parties that if you're young and haven't done this before is a big learning curve. So I would say one thing that could be very successful is at the country level, because every country is different, every market's gonna be different, forming you know, coalitions of people who can share experiences and create value within a group would be hugely valuable to the entrepreneurs that we work with. Um, because otherwise, they're all learning all of the same lessons all over again. And it's very, very expensive for them to do that. And if they could have a shared platform, not platform, technology platform, but a group. Um, and and so what would be necessary? So you have a set of entrepreneurs who are working on your platform, but still have this need. Is it something that you might look to the business community, either the network operators, the handset distributors, or would you look to a regulatory environment? Do you, do you have any thoughts on what we might pursue? Yeah, I think somebody like the ITU is a more natural home to, to drive the, the overall mission of this, because I think their, their role in the ecosystem is, is um, not biased. You know, I think all of the vendors, myself included, would bring certain biases to the table. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be at the table, but it probably means we shouldn't be leading it. Um, and I think that, that provides a, a unique perspective to say, look, we all agree applications can have huge public benefit. And we all agree that it's very difficult to figure out how to get them into the hands of people we want them in. What can we collectively do? So it, it sounds like you and Secretary Joe are on the same page about such a platform. Um, Stefan? Uh, you know, I mean, in a way, I think we've been a little bit blessed by almost having the reverse issue, which is, um, you know, what we provide to people is jobs and income. And that tends to be a very popular uh, type of service. Um, and so, you know, there's about 5,000 freelancers who sign up on our site every single day. And we, we actually don't have jobs for 5,000 new people every day. Um, so the, the challenge is more a challenge of, you know, helping them be successful. Like, how do you increase the chances of being, you know, one of the, f the few that get a job initially? Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't think I should ask ITU to fix that for us. I mean, I, I do think it's something that we need to own and we need to do a better job of. Um, generally speaking, it, it is a business of word of mouth. And if you looked at how 
our network is, you know, we're a network sitting on top of another network. If you look at how it, it has spread, it has all of the characteristics of a viral uh, network where, you know, you have a few people that sign up in Manila, you know, six or seven years ago, and next thing you know, like, because they were getting jobs and they were making, you know, significantly more money than what they were doing in their previous job, either replacing fully their previous job or as extra income, you know, they start telling their friends and their neighbors about it. The next thing you know, the whole island is using it and then it magically hops to the next island. Um, but it's all done through oral history. You know, this is my personal story of how I signed up and how I was successful. And I don't think we've necessarily done as good of a job as we could to institutionalize that and say, these are the best practices. This is what may be the most, you know, the biggest surprise to you as you come online and as you start using this service, because we have all of the collective memory, or we should be able to get the collective memory of the millions of people who signed up before. So your issue is the uh, supply side of jobs, less than the demand side. I mean, you know, it's it's like any marketplace. You know, it's complex, and you know, there's different jobs with different categories, and you know, in some jobs you're more supply constraint and in some jobs you're more demand constraint. But I think what is true in just about any category is you always have room for more exceptional people. Um, but you know, allowing these people to become exceptional is not necessarily something that uh, we've mastered to date and it's probably an opportunity for us to do better. So given so that we've had a discussion from infrastructure and, and regulation of infrastructure to the user experience and the platforms and the innovation. Do, do you see an open-mindedness in business models? Like you've talked extensively about the need for uh, multiple stakeholders to come together to make uh, you know, access possible for first-time users. And can you talk a great length about multiple stakeholders as well? Uh, and the need for, for an open mind. And, and do you see that, or more specifically, are there examples of open-mindedness to new business or models and innovations that we can use going forward as models? I, um, in, in our work, the, where we've been most successful is actually more in the traditional model. So in the, uh -huh. in the sense of me talking about having to, to load in the cost of the phone, our programs that are scaling are just doing that. So we didn't, we didn't cleverly solve that, that business problem yet. I think to achieve the scale we hope to, and in fact hundreds of millions of lives, we're gonna to need to solve that. Um, and, and I think there's a huge openness and willingness. And you know, everybody we talk to, nobody's saying, no, the current model works, just keep doing what we're doing and, and we don't need to change things. I do think um, the, the risk appetite is not quite, you know, we're a relatively small company, so we have a very large risk appetite. Um, and the, the risk appetite is not necessarily there among all the actors that we would like to see, but I don't think that's an unreasonable approach for them to be taking. Um, so from my perspective, I think it's commensurate with what I would expect based on the, you know, the, the size of the businesses we work with. But um, one interesting uh, topic that, that Stefan brought up is the data traceability. So if you think about um, one area that's not getting much innovation, if you can create a data record from somebody who's unconnected, you now have potential credit history, job history, all sorts yeah. of things that can be used to create social or financial capital and means to borrow against. That's an area that I think could explode if there was more effort and energy going into it. And I don't think a lot of people are there because it's, it's really tricky to figure out how you would create a, a for-profit or a non-profit model that could support that. But that's one area that I think, you know, we're interested in participating to it, not leading it, but I think that's a, that's a primary for innovation that, that could use more attention because it might be one of the magic uh, components that can help unlock that expansion. Ken, are you? Uh, yeah, uh, I believe that um, yeah, there are a lot of um, su successful cases in, in terms of the business model. And I believe that while the, uh, um, the position of the ICT and the uh, ICT technology uh, is getting uh, um, more and more deeper, you know, involved into the, deeply involved into the um, industrial application, um, we have a lot of chance to explore, you know, whether this model works or, 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 or the other model works. But I do support that we need a kind of platform across the different stakeholders mm -hmm. to figure out, you know, how they're going to, you know, exchange their ideas and how they're going to uh, eventually, you know, uh, develop a, um, you know, um, relationship which, you know, benefit to all, all the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. and. I believe that you know if you give them the opportunity to explore, 
and all the stakeholders will focus on the, uh, you know, the consumers because uh, the uh, technology will uh, give the consumers the chance to have better user experience and uh, the lower cost or higher efficiency. I think the, the business model, the successful business model is just a nature result of this exploration. So we don't need to worry about that. Excellent. <laughs> you know, given the time, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to take about a minute or so, maybe with any last thoughts that, that you'd like to pass along, and then I'll summarize and go from there. So maybe this time we'll start with Secretary Joe. I, I think that I talk too much, but you know. Uh, I just also want to add uh, that uh, part uh, of my comment for the business models. I think that uh, this is a democratic, democratic, democratic world. Sometimes, you know, that uh, to have uh, a common approach or the one model will be idea, but uh, in reality, it may not be that easy. So that, uh, you know, we might have to, you know, to, to, to seek the best interest for, uh, if a majority. Uh, mm -hmm. You may not be able to, you know, to just, uh, uh, you know, chose one to be considered the best, that you might have to, to accept the fact that you might have to live with several models as well, because oh. uh, it's the market development in the end who decide which one is successful, which one should be supported. So that uh, from, uh, from, uh, from my point of view, you know, that I would, uh, of course, encourage to have, uh, you, know, uh, you know, consolidated or common positions but also, I have to recognize that sometimes it's, uh, it's not that easy to reach uh, agreement uh, with uh, all the partners uh, for the business interest. So we have to accept uh, that kind of uh, uh, you know, reality as well. But uh, of course, you know, that if this covers not only for business model for the market development, but also for innovations of new technologies. Yes. And uh, people talked about uh, 3G, 4G, we better to have one, one common technology, but in reality, you cannot reach that far at this moment. So you have to, and for uh, any companies in the world, you may find uh, similar projects that you have offered different op options. Uh, and then you, uh, let's see what, uh, what, what to do. Uh, so this is uh, something you know, that we might also have to, that reminded me one, one thing. After my election in uh, Busan last year, the Korea uh, journalists ask me questions you know, that uh, you know in Korea now a lot of uh, smartphones, not Huawei smartphones, and Xiaomi. They, they know Xiaomi. Yes. I, I do not know that. You know the Xiaomi smartphone getting popular in Korea. And they try to to protect their market, saying that this is. This, I said you know that is not the best way. The best way is to really to encourage innovations, encourage uh, you know competitions that uh, let the market decide. You know the, anything you try to. To, 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 to eliminate by yourself in the end, it will not work. Very consistent theme about innovation from you today. Very exciting. Stefan? So, you know, I would just add to the, the business case discussion. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of models out there that project, you know, things like, you know, increasing GDP through, you know, more efficient, you know, processes and what have you, potentially better access to capital, um, you know, increase, employment or reduced unemployment, which has all sorts of, you know, positive consequences on crime rates. And, you know, there's all sorts of, like, really, really big numbers. Um, but all of them seem to be somewhat hypothetical and somewhat far out. I think what a lot of stakeholders tend to underestimate is one that's a lot more concrete, which is when you switch from the, an informal economy to a formal economy, where payments get digitized, taxes are much easier to collect. And that quite often adds up to a really significant number that comes up really, really quickly. Uh, and makes the business case potentially a lot more uh, interesting than what would be uh, considered otherwise. So not that I'm necessarily a proponent of taxation in general, but I think right. a lot of people tend to underestimate this, this fact um, that, you know, when you're digitizing the, the, the work or you're digitizing the experience, you're potentially also digitizing the transaction and creating records where records did not used to exist. And real quick, I'll just add, I, I'm hugely agreement that we need to keep the markets as open as we can and, and let exploration happen and it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. And on top of that, I think it's critical that we explore different spheres of business models. Right? So not just thinking about the mobile operator and the mobile subscriber, mm -hmm. but government 
taxes, revenues, you know, all these different ways to define a different business unit are going to be critical as we look at how to, how to figure out if these are really viable. Yeah, I, uh, I would say, uh, so firstly, to, uh, um, to develop a, uh, a stronger uh, broadband infrastructure, because this is the basis of the, any, any you know, um, application uh, in the future. Uh, actually, we can do that by uh, greatly you know, reducing the cost, encouraging the sharing, um, to, uh, uh, introducing the new mechanism for the uh, spectrum resource. And beyond that, we're going to have a uh, very exciting opportunity to develop different kind of you know, applications. And we will encourage you a open mind for any technological innovation and business innovation. And I do believe that with this kind of joint efforts, we're going to have more and more uh, applications which can really create value for the consumers and the societies. And in summary, I'd say I had two themes consistently from the panel. One I would categorize as collaboration, both from the sharing, also your suggestions about regulation and shared use of infrastructure, to the need for massive uh, diversity of, of stakeholders involved in both business models and uh, exploring ideas and, and looking at new formalized economies, but, but new systems as well. Also collaboration and helping local developers learn more, understand, helping people coming online, both have a good experience in how to use the phone, but also how to be global citizens, whether they're looking for work, how to understand multiple cultures, and overall that combination of innovation, new ideas, being open, and being open to collaborative models to solve this problem across, oh, excuse me, across the broad spectrum of what being connected means. Everything from the broadband infrastructure up to the employment opportunities, up to digital literacy and creation. Thank you. Thank you.